Hey folks, this is Robert Grossman and I'm interviewing Riley Holland, head coach of NRW today. How are you doing, Riley? I'm great, Robert. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks. So Riley, last time we talked a couple of weeks ago, we had this really interesting conversation. You actually started to explain what is mental toughness all about. And you were talking about how all the factors that usually people like me normally associate with mental toughness are actually secondary to what's really going on. Can Maybe just to get started with this, you could summarize what we talked about just to get everybody on the same page. Sure. So my basic definition of mental toughness is the ability to go into high pressure situations and not get your anxiety, fight or flight, survival response triggered by that pressure. Basically an ability to handle pressure. And that relates to how much basic tension do you carry around because the more tension that you have the easier these various factors of of the pressure of competition or other pressures are going to put you into that state of basic panic now that anxiety state the fight or flight is the most basic switch in your body brain system and when it's triggered then all of your emotional self all of your mental self chime in and they try to figure out what's going on and then you get stuff like distraction and then you get stuff like feeling of lack of confidence, self-esteem, motivation issues, all of these other things that we usually think of as being at the core of the mental game are actually secondary to this root cause of simply getting triggered into survival anxiety. Oh, it's interesting. So, so actually, mental toughness, would you say that mental toughness is the ability to be under pressure without getting triggered into anxiety? Basically, that's it. You actually say it uh, even simpler than I, than I did. Uh, if you imagine, the simplest metaphor is just imagine a glass of water. If it's already filled up almost to the brim, it's not going to take much for it to overflow. That's your tension. So if as you drain that glass of water, the more you can handle, the more you can have thrown at you, and you're still just operating at your peak level of performance because you're allowing your body to do its thing without letting the fear get in the way. I see. So actually, you know, that's uh, it's a little bit of bad news because it means that If I understand what you're saying correctly, all the usual methods of building mental toughness by like building confidence or, or, you know, getting psyched up for better motivation or exercises to improve focus, all that stuff is just addressing the secondary issues, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, unfortunately. And I can understand that it's tempting to want to look at these things individually because they are the most obvious manifestations of the problem and they're the most kind of in your face so that say for example if you find that you have anxiety before games because you keep thinking about a particular coach of yours and your relationship with that coach and what's coach going to think and maybe this guy's particularly tough on you or something like that It's very often the case that someone will tell you, well, you need to focus on understanding your relationship with that coach and work through it mentally and come to terms with that image in your own mind and everything and try to understand your problem. It doesn't matter if you understand the problem at all. The problem is not the coach. The problem is not your worries. The problem is the anxiety that's making that thought form spin out of control. If you get rid of the anxiety, then the whole thing just loses its power source. Otherwise, you end up actually very often multiplying the problem because now you're trying to understand something that's not going to go away by understanding it, so you complicate it even further. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I like that metaphor of of the the glass of water that you mentioned because it's like... uh, that's our pressure level, right? All the water that goes into the glass. And if, if it overflows, then we're like overflowing into anxiety and we experience all these secondary factors. Our confidence gets shaken and we lose our focus and we might have problems with motivation. But with the NRW approach, you're actually making the glass bigger. You're increasing our capacity 
to handle the pressure without getting overflowed into anxiety. Am, am I getting this? Yeah, yeah. You could say that we're both making the glass bigger and we're draining it. Oh, okay. So you're expanding your capacity for pressure, but you're also very concretely draining neuromuscular tensions in the body that have been there probably since the day you were born. And certain events can contribute to more of these tensions building as you grow up, but we're really dealing with a, a, a large and deeply rooted structure of tension here. It's something that is very rarely realized. And this is an important point. I'm not just talking about stretching your hamstrings out. This is something that goes very deep and very few people even know that they have these tensions. So yes, everybody has their own patterns of tension. And that also means that everybody has their own style of being freaked out. You mentioned these secondary things like confidence, lack of focus. When, you know, Jim's anxiety switch gets triggered, maybe it manifests in his own particular way. He's worried about his coach. When uh, Lance's gets triggered, he starts having issues with his self-image and negative self-talk. Everybody has their own style. But what I submit to the listener is this idea that your own personal style of anxiety doesn't matter. Only the anxiety matters. Go after that. Oh, you know, I love that because I've always had a philosophy in my life to go for the root causes of whatever issues I'm dealing with. Even if it's more difficult, even if it's slower, I just think it's a better choice to address the root cause of our problems, not the surface factors, because you can trim the leaves off of weeds, but they always keep growing back. When you get it out by the root, then it's gone. So I, I really like what you're saying, that, that uh, I guess that explains why NRW is so attractive to me personally, because it's really a way to address the root cause and I guess really in a way that nothing else does address. Yeah, that's been my experience. And it's also important to realize that this insight about the role of the survival anxiety as the root cause wouldn't do us any good if we didn't have a technique that actually dealt with it. Luckily, we do. <laughs> so we don't have to avoid that insight anymore. We have a solution, not just a problem. Yeah, okay, all right, well... That's fascinating. And so I can see how the more tension you have, the easier it is to get triggered into anxiety. And for sure, that's something I think we all can experience. I know I feel it just on a day when I have more tension that day. It's so much easier for little things to kind of tip me over where I lose my mental balance. Uh, and I can see how that's the case in a larger scale in life, too. Like there are just people who are just more tense by nature, right? But what are actually, I mean, when you talk about the factors that trigger us into anxiety, what kind of factors are you actually talking about? Well, there are a wide variety, but there's kind of a common cast of characters that you're going to come across as a competitive athlete. And these are very often isolated as the causes of performance anxiety or choking or what have you. Very simply, the things that tend to be the factors, the wild card that send the person into their anxiety state. These are sort of the input into your mental toughness black box. And then however much tension you have out of that either comes, you know, your composure or your freak out. So take, for example, I use that example of the coach, this idea of the, uh, the sort of the negative coach figure in your mind. But in a broader sense, there's just worrying about what other people are thinking. Now, this is a killer because as an athlete, a competitive athlete, you're performing in front of people, whether it's just, you know, a small bleacher full of folks or a giant stadium or even just your own teammates, coaches, and your opponents. You are under the microscope. You're being watched. And, of course, you want to do your best. Now, Worrying, obviously, we can say uh, countless platitudes about it. Like, remember my grandmother used to say, worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair. It doesn't get you anywhere, but you just keep moving, something like that, which is a nice thing to say, but it certainly doesn't help. Very often people will have similar bits of advice, like 
try to focus on what you're worrying about, understand why you're worrying about it, and then magically perhaps it will go away. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. It seems like worrying about what other people are thinking, feeling the weight of other people's eyes on you as you perform, is simply a factor that you have to accept as something that's going to be there, to one degree or another, when you go out to perform. Now, there's a phrase you come across a lot when you see people talking about sports psychology, mental training, stuff like that, which is you want to focus on the controllables. You want to try to focus on the things that you control and not so much on the things that you can't control. So, for example, if it's raining out on game day, you don't focus on the rain. That's out of your control. You don't worry about that. And that, by the way, is something that could also be one of these little anxiety triggers. But, in fact, take this idea. Your worry is actually itself a non-controllable. That might seem a little bit weird at first because it's your own thoughts. Right? You tend to think of your thoughts as something that you can control. Well, if we look a little closer, we see how that's a little bit naive. For example, if you sit still for a little while and you try to control your own thoughts and observe them as you do so, you find that you generally have very little control over your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, especially if you're already in a little bit of a state of arousal, of tension, of stress when you go into competition, as we said before, that triggers the mind to start thinking about things and start finding problems, right? So it's almost like a vicious cycle in a way. A mm -hmm. little bit of tension causes some worry. That worry causes more tension, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it's very easy to get spun out and try to deal with this on the level of worry, but that is how you lose the battle against that particular inner opponent, so to speak. All it is, is the, it's like the weather. Your thoughts, your worries about what other people are thinking are like the weather. You have no control over them. Just ignore them. Easier said than done, yeah, but that's what happens when you have less and less tension triggering you in the first place. So you're saying our worry comes and goes like the weather, but whether or not we get tied up into it and carried away with that worry depends on the amount of tension that we carry in our bodies? Yeah. So, for example, you're about to hit the field. You're concerned about how you're going to play. Mm -hmm. You're very, very tense. And then all of a sudden it dawns upon you that people who you care about are watching you. And that brings in more attention. What if this? What if that? What will they think? Even if you know very well that they're going to be nice to you no matter what. And then that can trip you over the edge. Anything can trip you over the edge at that point. Okay, well, it, it, that makes sense. I, I've certainly felt that before in situations when I was performing in front of other people or, or just even in social situations where I was conscious of being watched by other people. So I, I can relate to that, and probably everybody can relate to that. But how does NRW help with a situation like that? It's such a natural, common situation you describe. It is, and this is the kind of thing where, in a way, you have to go there to really see how this works, but I can describe it. When, when I say that when you drain the tension, these secondary things simply take care of themselves. So you talked about the idea of the glass getting bigger. So we're draining the water and the glass is getting bigger. When you're less tense, you might step out onto the field. So let's use a contrasting example. We've got the example of the guy who goes out and he's freaking out. Now let's think of the guy who goes out and he's already pretty calm. He's pretty relaxed. He's also aware that people are watching him, that something is at stake, but he's able to simply contain that thought. It's not triggering him because he recognizes well, this thought's perfectly normal. This isn't a problem, actually. It's actually not a problem to be worried. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're worried, if it's not triggering you. So you're actually able to simply have thoughts without being triggered by them. It's something that happens gradually, but very, very distinctly as you go through the process. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, as you describe this, I'm just thinking back, remembering how it has felt to me when I've been in situations where I got worried about what other people thought about me. And the way I remember this feeling, it's like it starts to absorb my focus and my mind is more and more like focusing on how are they seeing me and do they, do I look stupid? Does my voice sound wrong or whatever? thoughts are coming and it's distracting my focus completely. So I could imagine if, if I could just, uh, feel that, but not be concerned about it, maybe I could keep my focus on whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing. Definitely. Now let's take a look at a third example. Okay. So we've got the person kind of in the, who's very tense. They're getting freaked out and this is the straw that breaks their camel's back or what have you. Mm -hmm. We've got the person who's kind of made headway in the process. So they're, they've got this worry, but they're able to look at it and go, oh, this is just, there is worry. It's like the rain. It's no big deal. It's not my fault. I don't have to spin out on all of these different things. I'm just worried. And then there's a person who's more or less fit in mental toughness, so to speak, who's really drained it all and who's gone through the process. They go into that situation and the thought never even crosses their mind. Sure. If you ask them, they'd, they'd say, yeah, people are watching me. They're coming to conclusions about me. Maybe they're judging me. Yeah. But it's just not even a factor that has to be overcome. It's just not even there. You know, I think the most surprising aspect of what you're saying is the idea that this is all caused by tension in the body because that's not what we're normally taught. That's not what we're normally taught. But then you have to ask yourself, is what we're normally taught solving our problems? And as I look around, I see again and again, the answer is no. No, definitely not. I mean, most people, it's like uh, they say there's this research I keep hearing about that uh, the number one thing that people are scared about is public speaking more than death. People are scared of public speaking. So I think that, uh, have you heard that study? I keep hearing that study thrown around. I have. I, I uh, And I use that. Well, yeah, because I used to be um, a writing professor. I used to be very, very anxious, right? Very anxious with all this stuff, which is how I got into trying to figure it out in the first place. And I was a writing professor and I had a, an assistantship and I taught my first college writing course when I just turned 23 and I had massive stage fright, not just public speaking, but you know, being the authority and it was a night class. So half the people were significantly older than me and mm -hmm. walking into that room was probably the most horrifying thing I've ever done. And yeah, had to do it again and again and get over that, just move through that anxiety again and again. And yeah, the, the public speaking dread of being up in front of people, because it's similar to sports performance where you can be unbelievably talented and you can know what you're talking about and you can know what you're doing. You can know your position so well, but when this other factor comes in and that anxiety takes over, all that other stuff goes out the window or can go out the window, depending on how tense you are and how you respond to it. It's an entirely different skill set. simply being able to handle the pressure, having that mental toughness. And I had to learn that the hard way and find out for myself. And now I don't really think about it at all. And now I get like a little pleasant jolt of arousal, you know, when I go in to, to do a workshop or a presentation on this stuff or what have you. But it's just not even there. All this stuff, it's just gone. And, uh, you know, I, I can distinctly say that I was more afraid of public speaking than death for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess a lot of us can relate to that. But, you know, I, what I think is really, uh, really fascinating about this is just the contrast between what you're telling me and the, the normal way that people talk about this. Because I remember... Uh, you know, when I did my MBA, I was a member of the public speaking club and I had this problem too. I was terrified about what other people would think about me when I would, you know, stand in the room and have to speak. And they told me, well, just imagine everybody naked or imagine them wearing diapers or something. And then you'll just think it's funny. But now as I listen to you talking about it, I realize 
all that is is just like trying to cover up the the secondary factor. It's like a little trick to make it less disturbing, but it doesn't actually change the underlying worry at all, does it? I don't think so. I mean, maybe some people that works for them to a degree, but to me, these so-called normal methods are really just whistling past the graveyard. And, and worse, in a way, if you're visualizing people naked or in their underwear, then you're, first of all, diverting a lot of your energy towards doing that, right? Fo focusing on that. And you're basically holding the problem in your mind as a problem. You're guaranteeing that the problem will remain a problem by trying to fix it on that level. Yeah, it reminds, reminds me of the, uh, also reminds me of the classic advice for men who are a little bit too quick maybe in bed. Think about baseball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that cannot be good for keeping your focus where it's supposed to be. No, I, I doubt she would agree with that advice. Right. Um, <laughs> she'd be very flattered to know. Plus, isn't the whole point that you're in the experience, not distracting yourself from the experience? Exactly. And, I guess, and that's just the same if you're trying to deliver an inspiring speech or if you're on the playing field about to compete in an athletic event, isn't it? It's all the same. You've got to be in it. You've got to be present and activated and focused on what's happening, not on your little mental imagery that's designed to distract you away from your own worry. Yeah, it's just affirming your own worry. Uh -huh. you know, it's, okay. Because really, of course, if you're an athlete you want to perform. If, we, if you're doing any of these things, you want to do them well. But really, the only way that you're going to do that is if you just don't care how it goes. Give up the idea that it's important. Give up the idea that it matters what the other people think or the outcome matters. And a huge amount of that tension will disappear. Well, of course, it, it happens by reducing the tension in the first place. You can't make it happen through thought. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the outcome is that you go in and you're performing really well because you don't really care. You're not thinking about it. Thought has been dethroned, and then things just happen, and then your body knows what to do. Of course, you can't sell many books on sexual performance that say, your body already knows what to do. Just stop thinking about it. This book is the problem. You know, they're not, not going to do particularly well in the marketplace. And, of, and also, it's useless to simply say to yourself, oh, yeah, I don't care what other people think. I don't care what other people think. You know, you're not going to make it go away just by repeating that to yourself in your mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, as we talk about this, I'm starting to more and more clearly to understand the difference between addressing the root cause and just playing with the the secondary manifestations of that tension. So that, I think you've painted a crystal clear picture for me about, you know, about this situation, about worrying what others are thinking. Can you, uh, can you give me a different example? I mean, what other kind of factors are triggering us into anxiety that, uh, that we have to deal with? Sure, sure. Let me, before I do that, let me just say one more thing about what, what worrying about what other people think. This was a little bit of uh, when this clicked for me, it was a little bit of an epiphany. One of the other common things that people will say is that, oh, people aren't judging you. Right. I've heard that. But come on. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge lie, isn't it? Yes, they are. <laughs> and you're going to, sooner or later, you're going to find out. Denial doesn't work either. Okay. Uh, well, so on a similar vein, this one's really kind of almost an offshoot, and now you'll see why, is your own kind of negative thinking or overanalyzing. So let's say you've got a game plan or... You're in the game, and, you, and then you start finding that you're overthinking and second-guessing everything. Is my game plan right? Am I doing the right thing? Do I have, or blah, 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 and you just get kind of overwhelmed by all of this, and it gets in the way of your smooth functioning and performing. Well, again, the received wisdom, the common wisdom would, would say, well, let's look at the things that you think about. What do you think about? What do you second guess? And if we see those clearly and understand them, then they will go away because they're actually irrational. 
remember, be confident, you know, stuff like that. Like basically the equivalent of that, like that poster with a kitten hanging from a tree that says hang in there. You know, just trying to apply that in an intense competitive situation, probably not going to help. But if we take this sort of model of the root cause of these things being the tension and the anxiety, again, bring it back to basics, to simplicity, and each of these things falls into focus. If we realize that the problem is not the overthinking per se, but the tension and survival anxiety that are triggered that then manifest as the overthinking, then we realize don't focus on the overthinking at all because you're just going to get caught in its web. The problem is not there. The problem's in the tension, in the anxiety in the first place. So you're probably realizing at this point, it's actually not so much that these are the triggers at all, but once again, these are also secondary manifestations of the root cause, the tension, the anxiety in the first place. Yeah, so the uh, this tension manifests as worry or about overthinking, and then we try to fight it with mental methods, which just kind of sucks us deeper into it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's like it's for every head of the hydra you cut off, two more grow in its place. You know, like negative thinking, right? Like some methods, people who want to say, okay, what are, my, what are my beliefs about myself? And how can I replace negative beliefs and thought patterns with positive beliefs and thought patterns? Right. But why have thought patterns at all? What's the point of that? Is that really going to be the deciding factor? It might help you feel better about yourself, but we're not talking about self-esteem in the sense of simply only believing that you're great. Anyone can hypnotize themselves into believing that they're great performers until the moment that they take the field and realize that that's actually not the case. You know, we're interested in what happens when the stakes are high. What happens when the actual battle is waging, not when you're sitting comfortably at home repeating affirmations to yourself and feeling good about nothing but thin air. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Can you give me another example? Yeah, so let's take, um, let's say you're in a game, you make a mistake, or there's some sort of a setback. Something happens like a bad call. Ref makes a bad call. You know, these can be, have cascading effects uh, and really, if you look at all of these examples, they also have something else in common, which is something that's really not such a big deal has a major effect on your game, a, a mountain out of a molehill. And that's the sort of the domino effect that can happen when you're very tense or when you have a sort of a chain reaction of tension, where if you make one mistake, then you get tense and then you start coming to all of these conclusions about, oh, I'm not really that great after all. All those negative thinking beliefs start kicking in, right? But remember, right. But remember, they're secondary to the tension in the first place. But they are there. And then things just get out of control. And it feels like the momentum has shifted. That mistake is now who you are in the game. And if that triggers your tension, then the more tension you have, the easier it is to get even less composed, right? Again, the, the snowball builds and builds and builds. Or simply being in the losing position, you know? There's nothing like looking up at the scoreboard and feeling like you're the loser. And then mm -hmm. you start thinking, oh, I'm not just losing right now. I am the loser. It can be very uh, intense. You, you know, while you, as you describe this, I just... Uh... I have a few memories coming back of the last few times I saw a James Bond movie and I'm just remembering how, you know, no matter what happens to James Bond, no matter how bad the situation is, no matter how many mistakes are made, he always has this perfect equanimity and composure. He's always just executing his skills with perfectly clarity of mind. So do you think that uh, NRW was a big part of James Bond's training program? <laughs> well, if, you know, James Bond is an ideal uh, character, you know, generated by people's hopes and wishes about what they might one day be themselves. 
or what they wish they could be in their own fantasies. If this ideal person were real, they would have had to do something like NRW to get there because no one gets through childhood and, and adolescence without developing lots and lots of these tension patterns that result in these problems. You know, maybe there's someone out there, but I kind of doubt it. But with that outcome is, yeah, that's what we're going for, is that being able to separate your sense of who you are, how you're performing, your own confidence from whatever happens to be going on around you. You, you should be at 100% whether you're totally behind at the end of the game or if you're totally on top. It shouldn't. Why would that make a difference? That's not who you are. That's just what's going on around you. Absolutely. And either way, either way, when the next event happens or the next moment comes when you need to act to win the next point or gain the next bit of advantage or whatever it is in whatever sort of event you're involved in, you've just got to be present, right? It doesn't matter uh, how much ahead or behind you are. It doesn't matter what mistakes you made two minutes ago. It matters what's happening now and how well can you basically activate your training and allow your body to respond the way that it must. Sure. Every moment should be a rebirth. You're starting from scratch every moment. And again, don't be fooled. That's not something that you can do by trying to, okay, now I'm going to be reborn this moment. Okay, now I'm going to be reborn this moment. You can't do it through mental effort, but it's simply the consequence of having a smooth, functioning, mentally tough body-brain system that's not being jolted by every passing wind. You know, one, this happens cumulatively over the course of training NRW and transforming your entire nervous system into something that's more James Bond-like, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's also, let's take a look at some of the actual technical stuff. So we have full session work, which Robert, as you know, is pretty intensive and a session is usually once a week at the most because it can have a lot of impact and guided through a variety of exercises in a particular way, coordinated with breath for about an hour, hour and a half, depending. But we also have these warm-up exercises. And you can get a good taste of these, actually, if you sign up for the Tension Blaster free mini-workout at tensionblaster.com to get a sense of, of what some of these are. Now, these are pretty easy-to-do exercises, sort of like push-ups and sit-ups, and let's say if you're down in a game and then you've got halftime, you can do some of these exercises to help get that sense of wiping the slate. You just go in, you do your face stretching, or you do your shoulder exercise, or you do your backwards breathing exercise. You get that tension level down, and then suddenly those thoughts and worries and bad feelings aren't there anymore because you pulled out the root a little bit, right? So that's something that you can do gradually while you're still draining the big tensions over time. You can still use these sort of quick and dirty tools if you put them in your tool belt, if you learn them here and there. You know, you can't always do them. You can't stop in the middle of the field and start doing them. But you can bring them in and they can have a major impact on pre preventing the momentum from going and continuing to go in the wrong direction. Right. Okay. So there's a whole set of tools that we can use either as a, as a kind of type of long-term training to build up our capability to deal with tension, but also there's these kind of quick action tools that you can use in the moment when you need it. Exactly. Right, nice. And to what extent is this already a part of the training of, you know, professional athletes or Olympic athletes? Because the more you talk about this, the more I just realize how crucial this is. So how much of this are athletes doing already? Well, my suspicion is zero. I mean, of course, I don't know what everyone out there is doing, but this is not something that's very well known at all. And my reason for suspecting that it's not common at all is just the confusion with which the conversations are normally carried on about sports psychology or about mental training or about 
what people do. I mean, some people are just really on the close to the end of the spectrum of being naturals at this sort of thing. And so they're better than everyone else at it. And so it's not a problem for them. And so they're champions. Well, you know, someone can be really strong naturally. And if you're in a world where no one ever lifted weights, then they'd beat everyone who had not as much natural strength. But then if you add the element of weightlifting and strength training, everything changes. That's sort of where I feel like we are now with this whole mental toughness thing. Nobody really quite knows what to make of this side of the game. And if you examine closely the kind of ways that people are talking about it, that's clear. I mean, people can identify when someone's having a problem with their mental game. People can identify the various aspects and characteristics of being in the zone or being in the flow when you're in total mental training you know, perfection. But we don't know how to make it happen. We don't know how to make it more consistent. We don't know how to make it happen for people who are not naturals. And that just seems to be something that people are accepting. I don't really understand why, per se, especially when you look around and realize, and especially for me working with people all the time, I get to see the insane amounts of chronic neuromuscular tension people carry around and consider to be normal, especially something like breathing. I mean, breathing is an enormous problem. For, for most people, it's almost preposterous. And that's especially a problem because if you can't breathe properly, then you're very much more likely to get triggered into an anxiety state because breathing is a big part of what happens during the fight or flight response. Most people actually breathe in a fight or flight response all the time. Now, that is not something that we should be just accepting, but people do because A, they don't recognize that it's happening because they've adjusted to it. And it's so normal that no one even notices. And uh, B, they wouldn't know what to do about it anyway. And even elite athletes have the same problem. Of course they do. They haven't recognized this problem by and large, and they haven't attacked it directly. Well, you know, in my, I can really relate to that because in my own personal work with NRW, the, the effect it's had on my breathing is actually by far my favorite aspect of it. I mean, when I started, I didn't realize that I had a problem with my breathing. I wasn't able to feel that. But now my breathing has opened up so much compared to where it was when I started. And I just love it because it's just so much more comfortable. And it seems like, uh, well, it's easier for me to go to sleep. I seem to be uh, calmer when I'm in crisis situations or stress situations. And I can really, you know, I can feel that, that natural breathing going on, or at least more natural than when it was when I started it, it really has a lot of benefits just day to day in my everyday life. And I, I guess, uh, truth be told, I'm still at the beginning of the process of opening up my breathing with this. So I, I, I can really relate to that and understand, and, and I see how that would be tremendous asset for an athlete as well in a competitive event. I mean, it seems like this is really something that any serious athlete ought to pay attention to just because it can provide competitive advantage, especially if few people are doing it. Yeah, plus it makes everything a lot more fun. You know, I think any any serious person should be addressing this that's obviously my bias, but I think that if uh, if you really look at the problem, I, I I mean, here's a litmus test for you. You know how people often say if you're worried or if you're spinning off into anger or some other thing, they say take a deep breath. If when you find yourself spinning off in one way or another and you take one deep breath you should feel a major gear shift and you find yourself coming right back to center and wherever you were going into anger or fear, or whatever dissolves like a mist. That means that your breathing is open. Hmm. If anything else happens then it's not. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Now that's, I think that's actually, it's a very 
perfect thought to close with that any serious person ought to be addressing this because I assume that uh, anybody who's listened this far into this interview is a serious person and therefore must be practically foaming at the mouth by this time to get started and, and get into this. So can you, I know you gave it a couple minutes ago. Can you give once again, what's the website where we can go to download those, uh, those quick five minute tension blaster exercises? Sure. If you go to tensionblaster.com and you'll see where you can sign up and you'll receive a series of emails with some stories, some more explanation and some videos demonstrating some of the most basic NRW exercises. So you can try it for yourself. You know, it's fun to listen to, to, well, I hope it's fun to listen to me talk about it, but it's really all about the experience that you have with it. So, you know, give it a shot for yourself. See if it's, uh, see if it's your thing. And, um, tensionblaster.com. You'll see where you can go from there. If you wanted to get into more serious training. Oh, great. Riley, that was super insightful, and I think it was really practical, too, because you're giving us actual methods that anybody can use to address these issues. And I, most of all, I hope that for many, many people who will listen to this, that it's going to be very useful and that people will put it to action in their life uh, and go to that tensionblaster.com website and get those and, and try them and use them and benefit from them. So, uh, so thank you, Riley. Thank you, Robert. Always a pleasure. If you're an athlete looking to improve your mental toughness, the free Tension Blaster mini workout could be the edge you're looking for. Turn your nerves into raw, primal power to get in the zone and dominate the competition. Go to TensionBlaster.com to get the free exercises now.